Okay, hi, welcome to Micro Seminar on uh, January 16th. This is the first Micro Seminar of 2015, and uh, ready to rip here is uh, Lizzie Wilbanks. She's a postdoc at Caltech in Victoria Orphans Lab. She did her graduate work at UC Davis with uh, Jonathan Eisen and Mark. Uh, oh, man, you're going to have to help me. But Facciotti. Facciotti. Sorry for butchering that. And uh, she did her undergraduate at Swarthmore. And today she's going to be talking about the Pinkberry Consortia. We're very excited to hear about the ooey gooey balls and uh, follow up on that excellent trailer from earlier. So, uh, Lizzie, take it away. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's really nice to e meet many of you and see old friends. Um, so, I'm going to start screen sharing here and hopefully this goes okay. Let's get share. Okay, share. All right, is everybody seeing my title slide? Yeah? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about uh, some of the projects that I was most excited about from my graduate work. Um, and this is the story of the Pinkberry Consortia. And so just before I get started, there were so many people that were involved in this work. And I'm going to try and highlight the stuff that they've contributed uh, throughout, throughout all of this. But um, yeah, so just wanted to sort of, this was definitely a group effort from a lot of amazing collaborators that I had the privilege to work with. So when we think about the world, and I'm preaching to the choir here at Micro Seminar, but, uh, you know, we live in a microbial world. And then, you know, thinking about that, how do we track the interactions of the wild microbes that make up this world around us? Um, how are we going to peer into the world at their scale? Uh, we're going to need some fancy big binoculars. And so thinking about this from sort of the scale that we're going to have to cover here. It goes from single cells to whole ecosystems. Um, and so we're going to need a range of different tools that uh, can sort of span that thing. And I'm going to sort of highlight some of the different ways that we've used uh, these different types of tools to examine what's going on in the Pinkberry Consortia. So you know what? Hold on just a second. I'm having trouble because it's actually not pulling up my animations, which is too bad. But we can work with that. All right, let's see. Uh, hopefully this will work. Okay, so uh, this was work that started when I was a grad student uh, attending the microbial diversity course uh, at the MBL uh, in Woods Hole. And so this was the field site that we went out to the first week of the course. Uh, this is the Sipwisset Salt Marsh. Um, and we kind of walked in this main tidal channel here. Uh, and you come to some of these little intertidal pools in the Spartina eelgrass marsh. Um, and then this is what these pools look like. Um, you can see maybe why I wanted to keep coming back so much. If you look below the surface of that pond, you see this beautiful carpet of aggregates. Uh, and these are the pink berries. Uh, they are essentially balls of bacteria, and they're something that people in connection with the microbial diversity course had been studying for, you know, ever since the course had started about 34 years ago. So um, if you cut them in half, uh, this is what you see on the dissecting scope. So you see these pink tubules that go through a clear exopolymer matrix that we think is uh, exopolysaccharide. Um, and now if we take this and make thin sections of it, uh, oh sorry, this is a, a further zoom in under the dissecting scope. And so what you're seeing here are these islands of cells, not individual cells, we're at 200 microns here, uh, but you're seeing islands of these aggregate cells. Um, and these are the purple sulfur bacteria that are making up the, the majority of the biomass in these aggregates. So if you look at a thin section on the confocal microscope, what you can see here in purple is the autofluorescence, uh, the photosynthetic pigments from those purple sulfur bacteria. Uh, and then in green is the reflection signal here that we're looking at. And that's showing you where their intracellular sulfur inclusions are inside there. So we've got these really tight, uh, cool little uh, aggregates here that are forming uh, in the inside of the aggregates. So we wanted to look a little more quantitatively at what was in uh, the consortia here. Um, and if you look here, this is a 16S library that we did from a couple different years and three different sites, from Little Sipwisset Salt Marsh and then also from Penzance Point uh, Marsh in Woods Hole. And then uh, if you look here in the bars, you can see that about 60% of the clones that we recovered were from two species. Uh, these were uncultured species. We called them PBPSB1 for purple sulfur bacteria and PBSRB1 for pinkberry sulfate reducer. 
uh, because of the things that they were related to in the database. Uh, and you can see the rest of the diversity here is made up by sort of a smattering of different species. So it's definitely not just these two dominant bugs that are in there. Uh, we also see about five to ten different species in the bacteroidetes, some cyanobacteria, some diatom chloroplasts, and alpha proteobacteria. But the main players here are these, these two species. So who are these? Let's meet them. Um, so on the left here, you can see this is my cartoon of PBPSB1, the purple sulfur bacteria. Uh, and this is a bug that uh, is a phototroph, and it takes uh, hydrogen sulfide and oxidizes it to sulfate to get its reducing equivalence uh, to fix carbon. Um, and then uh, its friend, PBSRB1, uh, is just related to sulfate reducing organisms. So these take sulfate, they breathe sulfate and produce sulfide as a byproduct. So one of the natural conclusions from looking at uh, the taxa, the cultured relatives that these bugs were related to, was that we might have this intraberry sulfur cycle that was happening uh, at a very small scale so that they could be recycling some of these nutrients uh, inside there, possibly in addition to using sulfide that was coming out of the sediment. Um, and so one of the things that makes sense about this is that the ponds where we find these, that we find them at the sediment water interface, like I showed you, uh, and that is a really dynamic environment. So over the course of the day, you get the chemocline migrating up and down by a couple centimeters. So there are times when they're bathed in lots of sulfide. These guys have tons of food, right? And then there are times during the day when they could end up being sulfide starved. Uh, so maybe it would be advantageous to have a friend. Who knows? Uh, so then the other side of this that we postulated, and a number of people in the course had postulated for years, was that you could get photosynthate feeding uh, the reducing equivalents for the sulfate reducer here. Uh, again, in addition to stuff that might be coming out of the sediment and be nice and juicy. So this was a model that people had been kicking around for a while, and uh, we were interested in trying to test it. So working with a group of two other students, uh, we sort of started cracking away at the berries. So one of the first experiments that we did was uh, grinding them up and doing some metagenomics. And this was sort of our first generation metagenomics with uh, Illumina and 454 sequencing with the goal of assembling, pulling out genomes, and then trying to look at the sulfur redox chemistry that was present uh, and see if we saw the pathways to do this, uh, to do this cycle that we were, were postulating. So just quickly, is everybody seeing this full screen? Does everybody see both the top and the bottom? It's looking like it's cutting off in my little version here, but anybody? No? Looks okay. Okay. We'll keep going. Lizzie, um, I, maybe you can tell us what you think is supposed to be the top. I can see all the way to the top of a like half of half sphere. Okay, yeah. Can you see thiosulfate at the top? Yes. Okay, great. Cool. Just wanted to make sure in my little preview here it looked like it was cutting it off. Okay, charging ahead. So um, these were the pathways that we recovered and uh, based on the complete genomes that we were able to bin out for uh, the purple sulfur bacteria and the sulfate reducer here at the bottom. Uh, we saw the complete uh, oxidation pathway for both sulfide and thiosulfate uh, and then also for sulfate reduction in the other partner. Um, you know, one caveat to put here is that we were able to bin these complete genomes but they were in a ton of pieces. So we had, you know, thousands of contacts uh, for both of these two different organisms. Um, but we definitely had the genetic potential to carry out this cycle. But then you come to this important question, do genomics match reality, right? Because they were a hypothesis about what they could be doing, but it wasn't necessarily evidence that that cycling was happening uh, at a nanometer scale within these consortia. So looking at activity, one of the first experiments we did was to put these berries in a bottle um, and watch them over a light-dark cycle for a couple days. Um, so in one condition, we were hoping maybe we'd be able to see that sulfide getting produced, and we didn't. So if you just put berries in a bottle, we never saw anything happen over the course of our experiment. But if we fed them sulfide, one millimole of sulfide at the beginning, what we saw was that over the course of the experiment, you got uh, sulfide oxidation uh, in the berries, but not in our abiotic control. So the berries were in net sulfide sink. Um, okay, so we're seeing sulfide going in, but we never see it coming out. So that left us with questions about how we could get at the activity of the sulfate reducing organism in the consortia. So we wanted to hunt for this guy a little bit more carefully. So we did this first uh, using fish. So we made a specific probe uh, to the berry sulfate reducer. And this is work that was done uh, with Uli Yekel and uh, Verena Salman, uh, who were students with me at the course and were grad students at the time at the MPI. Uh, in Germany. And so this probe here, shown in green, targeted the 16S sequence we recovered from our clone library, and we were able to visualize where our sulfate reducer was showing up. So 
it's nestled very specifically in the islands of the purple sulfur bacteria. And this was really exciting to me because that's what I would expect to find uh, if you were seeing organisms that were sharing nutrients uh, or in some way exchanging an end product, whether or not that was beneficial or parasitic. You would expect them to minimize the distance between the cells. Uh, and that's exactly what we saw here. Um, so the next step that we wanted to do was to try and see if we could actually see recycling of those sulfur nutrients. And so this was an experiment where we set out to track it using isotope labels. So we used a 34 enriched sulfate compound, uh, which we spiked into uh, some incubations. And the goal was to see if we could see that sulfate being reduced to sulfide and then getting oxidized and stored in these intracellular sulfur inclusions that the purple sulfur bacteria has. And then we were going to look and see if we could find that uh, using nanosims. Uh, one of the good things about this system was that we didn't expect to see any backflow. Uh, that is, we wouldn't see direct incorporation of the 34 sulfate label by the purple sulfur bacteria uh, because they get all of their sulfur predominantly from the uh, reduced sulfur pool and they lack a lot of the trans all of the transporters uh, and the genes for uh, assimilatory sulfate incorporation. So our assumption was that if we saw sulfate being uh, this label ending up in our purple sulfur bacteria that it was evidence for syntrophic transfer uh, from their friends. Um, we also added a 13C bicarb label to uh, track uh, the uh, autotrophic activity during the course of our incubation. So uh, this is what our experiments look like. We had these sediment-free microcosms with berries at the bottom, a little bit of uh, filtered natural seawater and our isotope labels that were stuck in the middle. Um, and then at the end, so what we did with these was we then uh, sacrificed them at the end, fixed them, and make thin sections uh, in OCT and place that on a glass round. Uh, and then we were analyzing those with nanosims. So this was in collaboration with Victoria Orphan, who was course faculty uh, during the MBL course uh, and offered sort of to give us a first round of uh, nanosims on the instrument and then sort of following up from there. Uh, and then I, we went down uh, later and I was working with Abby Green and Sean and Young Bin uh, at the Caltech Microanalysis Facility to do some of this work. Um, so for those of you that need a brief overview of, of what NanoSims does, uh, what you do is you take, so this is our tissue section here of the pink berries, and then we're going to bombard it with a primary beam of cesium ions. Uh, and what that's going to do then is blast off our sample as its component secondary ions which we then focus in the mass spectrometer uh, to get up to seven different mass images. Here I'm going to present what we did with four of them. Um, and by rastering across the surface here, you're able to generate a heat map of your ion abundance of different masses. So here we were looking at 12C, 13C, and also uh, 32 and 34 sulfur. Um, and so all of this was in uh, our publication that we just recently had come out last year in EM. Um, but I'm going to go over what we found for the sulfur label. So if you see here on the right, uh, this is the overlay of the 12, uh, the, the carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur in their light isotopes. Uh, and it's showing you uh, these sort of ghostly outlines of the purple sulfur bacterial cells. And that's just to locate where the cells are here. And then if you look at the ratio of the 34 to the 32S ion um, as a heat map, and what we're seeing here, Blue is where our unlabeled controls, the natural abundance here was, and then warmer colors are showing you uh, uptake of our labeled uh, sulfur compound. And so you can see here that we definitely have uh, about 2x enrichment of uh, the isotopes uh, for sulfur in these cells. And what was exciting was that we even saw some hot spots here that were about the size and shape of what we'd expect for the elemental sulfur inclusions. Um, and so there's, there's sort of some more detailed plotting of that in our paper, but essentially what we were able to show uh, was the incorporation of this label into the cells. Um, when we added a molybdate inhibitor for sulfate reduction, so we knocked out this part of the pathway, what we saw was that we lost that enrichment uh, in the purple sulfur cells. So in addition to doing that, uh, that work, we also did some stuff looking at the intraberry sulfur sulfide geochemistry. So what I mentioned before, we couldn't measure sulfide being evolved into the solution but we were able to detect some at very low levels inside these aggregates. And this was work that was done with some really fantastic geochemistry collaborators, uh, Dave Fike and Greg Druschel's group, um, using both microvoltometry to measure the sulfide and then also sulfide capture on silver wires 
uh, to sort of capture it and then look at the abundance and the isotopic composition. And what we saw basically was sulfide that had a composition that was consistent with sulfate reduction. Um, if you're curious, there's more uh, in our paper. So uh, what I've showed you so far, just kind of recapping where we've been, is that we found uh, complementary sulfur redox pathways in the two organisms that made up the consortia. And we saw a, an intimate physical association between these two buggers. Um, and we also saw uh, stable isotope labeled sulfur was being transferred uh, throughout uh, the consortia. So we're able to sort of actively look for this cycling. Okay. So maybe before I go on, does anyone have questions about that part? Or should we wait and do questions at the end? Cameron, what do you want to do? Well, if you have questions, send them to the hashtag U seminar, micro seminar, or if you're inside, uh, you can you can you can speak up right now, or you can type into the group chat box. Um, otherwise, if we don't hear anything about five seconds or so, um, I think we'll just let you go and we'll take questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. Anybody? Okay. Only comment so far was from my son. He said they're not buggers. <laughs> Microscopic buggers. All right, thanks, Jack. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to shift gears and talk about some unpublished work um, that we've done with the berries using them uh, as kind of a metagenomics test kitchen. So the Eisen Lab does a lot of sort of development for metagenomics stuff, uh, and the berries turned out to be a really nice system to work with for a number of reasons. Uh, First of all, there are natural communities, so you have that strain all variation and sort of long rare biosphere tail that you wouldn't get from a, a synthetic consortia. We can ask real, I have real questions about their, uh, their biology and um, things that we couldn't get from our fragmentary genomes, right? So, you know, we, we would be interested in things about gene neighborhood, but we'd have them in these teeny tiny little 10 kb pieces. That was frustrating. Um, and we also had enough biomass to work with that uh, it, it was a, we were able to use some of these other techniques that were emerging. Um, so uh, we, were, we were kind of working with some new sequencing technologies for long read metagenomics uh, to sort of start looking at some of this. So before I dive into what we did, I just kind of want to briefly recap for people maybe who don't think about metagenomics all the time, what makes this hard uh, and why, why it might need more development and why it isn't a solved problem. Uh, in the same way that sequencing bacterial uh, isolate genomes has become. So when you're putting together a genome, essentially what you have are puzzle pieces, right? So your DNA reads that you're getting are your the pieces to the puzzle that you're trying to put together when you do genome or metagenomic assembly. Um, and the larger those pieces are, the easier it is to put together your puzzle. For anyone who's ever dumped out those thousand piece puzzles, those are really hard, right? So if you've got bigger pieces, it's easier to see what you're putting together. And metagenomics essentially then is taking a single puzzle, uh, instead of trying to just put that together, you've got a whole bookshelf full of puzzles. You knock over the bookshelf and then you try and put it all together. So that can be a very complex problem in terms of assembly and binning uh, and getting your organisms back together and figuring out what's going on. So. Here's what we did. So we were trying to use some of these new uh, sequencing technologies for long reads. So this is not, Illumina short read is about 100 to 250 base pairs now. Uh, we're talking much longer bases. So our first opportunity to do this came from working with Mickey Cortez and Tim Blaukamp at their startup uh, Moleculo. Um, and this was a technology that had the ability to generate 2 to 20 kilobase reads. Uh, and this is an Illumina synthetic long read base technology. So I'm not going to go into the details here if you're curious. Uh, it's all over the internet how it works. The company has now been acquired by Illumina, and I think they're calling it LRSeq or something. Um, so what this essentially does is a dilution to extinction, and then you end up with uh, this. Uh, it's a library prep method. So then the the data goes onto the the DNA in the library that you've made with Molecular goes onto the machine. You redo the barcodes, and then you get these synthetic long reads coming out. Um, we also generated at that same time. Uh, a full lane and uh, my, my run uh, as sort of our control to see what we were going to be getting out of the berries. And this was done from a mixture of, I think, 10, 10, 5 to 10 different aggregates uh, to get enough biomass. Um, we then, uh, after doing that, I was uh, talking to Meredith Ashby, and she was interested in pursuing doing some PAC bio sequencing to compare how well that might 
uh, work uh, given our preliminary results that I showed her from Moleculo. Um, so again, PacBio, this is a different technology. It's a real-time single molecule sequencing technology. It's also capable of generating reads that are in the same length uh, distribution. Um, and just to be really clear up front, this was sort of, these were both experiments of opportunity. So it was not designed to be a direct comparison. So in, there were there biological differences because we didn't have enough of this DNA to send a pack bio. This was done from a single aggregate mostly, uh, whereas this was done from a mixed pool of aggregates. So there definitely are biological differences that will influence uh, what we've been able to get from both of these two technologies. But the thing that I want to you know, emphasize and to just show you guys here today is what we've been able to do with it so far with the data that I have in hand. So just keep in mind that it's probably not a fair comparison uh, between the two. Ah, I thought I had how much data we had from each. Oh, maybe I don't. Okay, so one of the first things that you might want to know about the amount of data or about what, what the sequence looks like um, is whether or not we're getting a similar diversity of taxa back from the raw sequence reads that we're getting uh, from both technologies. And so what I'm showing you here, this is just an example of the percent of classified gamma proteobacterial reads. This is just taking the reads, uh, looking for their best blast hit, uh, and then categorizing them as the different gamma proteobacterial taxa. And you can see here uh, the PacBio in red, and it's matched my seq library in sort of light pink and then the molecular library in blue, and it's matched MySeq library in blue. And you can see the distributions here are very similar. Uh, so we're pretty confident that when we sample these with both our sort of current industry standard of the MySeq Illumina um, and the long read technologies, we're recovering a similar diversity uh, in, the, in the data that we're getting back. Okay, so what do these reads look like? So here I've taken uh, these long reads, both molecular here on top, and pack bio on the bottom. So what you're seeing here, each bar is a single read. Um, and I've aligned it to one of our reference genomes. Uh, so this window here is showing you a 33 KB stretch. Um, now here, this is showing you these little, everywhere there's a black tick, that's an insertion deletion error. So the first thing that's really obvious is that there's a big difference in the error rate between the two methods. Molecular is very high accuracy, has an error rate of around 0.3%. Uh, um, which is great. PacBio's error rate is around uh, 15%. So it, you know, you've got this balance between read accuracy and consensus accuracy. So what do I mean by that? The PacBio errors, the, the saving grace for the PacBio errors is that they're really almost perfectly random. Um, so as you get increased sequencing depth with PacBio, you can eventually buffer out the reads by the consensus sequence between them. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's not something we need with the molecular technology, but the molecular technology is made with the Illumina sequence prep, so you do have some issues with uh, coverage bias and that sort of thing. Okay, so looking at that, what have we been able to assemble, keeping in mind the fact that I've told you that there were different amounts of input data uh, and, and different, different biological samples. So, so far what we've been able to assemble is about 18 megabases total assembly size from PacBio, uh, you know, between about 30 or so from Molecula, and then the short read assembly is much larger, uh, about 120 megabases of total assembled sequence data. Okay, but how many contigs are each of those in? Uh, and you notice here that on the y-axis, this is at a log scale. So we have 169 contigs here from PacBio, uh, about 1,000, 2,000 in Molecula, and then almost uh, you know, above 10,000 here for our short reads. So many, many more pieces, even though we're sampling a larger sequence space. How big are these contigs? So for our short read assemblies, you can see here our max contig size was about over 500 KB, which is pretty good. But the one thing that I want to emphasize is that this was not one of the two dominant organisms. This was uh, flavobacteria. Um, and just kind of emphasizing that sometimes the biggest assemblies you get out of the short read are not the most abundant things that are there, they tend to be the most clonal or the things that are just assembling best by the sort of uh, vagaries of De Bruyne graphs. So if you look here, our molecular assembly was actually shorter than our longest one, but if you compared it to uh, the biggest purple sulfur bacterial assembly, it beats it by about twofold. The pack bio uh, was off the charts comparatively. Uh, we had a 3.5 megabase contig fallout of our first uh, crack at assembling the pack bio data de novo, which was pretty fantastic. Um, so 
I'm just going to give you a quick preview of what some of that looked like. So this is the genome that we were able to recover from the complete assembly of the PAC bio metagenome. Uh, you can see here, this is the genome for PBPSB1, uh, and I'm showing in here uh, as a sort of woven but circular genome. Uh, there were nine contigs that made up this total backbone, uh, and we found all of the marker genes that you would expect in a complete genome. Uh, so the question is, uh, did we close this genome from metagenome? Um, and I think in some ways that's the wrong question, because this genome is open for business, and one of the coolest things that you can see in the PAC biodata is the way that this is a dynamic genome with different strainal variants and uh, population variants. So another thing to bring up here is that it's not unheard of to recover complete uh, closed genomes from metagenomics these days, but uh, with this kind of genome, it is, because this is an eight, uh, eight to nine megabase genome, depending how much of the flexible genome you in include, and it's riddled with transposases, CRISPRs, phage, different introns, uh, so it's a very complex bacterial genome compared to some of the ones that are being recovered from metagenomics as, as closed genomes. Um, so you'll probably have noticed while I've had this up here that you have some of these weird little structures here, uh, and these are a really interesting feature of what we're able to pull out of these genomes, these little bubbles. So this is a zoom in on one of those bubbles. Uh, and essentially what you're seeing here, this is a contig assembly graph from the Solera assembler. So each node here is a DNA sequence, and the edge is showing you the best overlap between those sequences that it found in the database. So this is one of our long backbone contigs, but then we see there's also an alternate assembly path here uh, through this uh, contig 42. So what's going on there? If you zoom in on that, this is our backbone contig on the top, and on the bottom uh, is that little side edge. And what you can see here in, in red are places where it's conserved, um, nearly 100% identical. And then here is an area where there's been a large insertion. And if you look at what those genes are, these little boxes here, you can see that most of them are transposases. So this is an area where you have mobile genes doing just that. They're being mobile, and they're present in one place in some of the strains in the population that we sampled, and they're absent uh, in some of the other ones. So that was pretty cool. So this is one of the first times I think that we've had a technology that lets us sample uh, these this sort of mobile genetic elements and look at transposase dynamics uh, in natural populations. Okay, but I sort of spent the whole first part of the talk telling you about you know this consortia and its biology. So what have we been able to get out of these new genomes that we couldn't tell before? And is there something that it could tell us about how they might be specialized for life in the phototrophic consortia? This is one of the questions that I was really interested in. So when I was looking through the annotations of these genomes, one of the first things that I found that really caught my eye was some of these phototrophy genes. I was like, what? Oh, no, we must have a binning problem. There must be a chimera. But looking closer, it turned out that these were annotated as a putative rhodopsin. Um, rhodopsins are these membrane proteins uh, that can sense light using their retinal cofactor. And in response to that, they pump ions across the membrane. Um, so, okay, what was this doing in our bug? If you look at this compared to a uh, synteny plot against the two closest relatives, Desulfa capsa and Desulfa bulbus, what you'll see here is that we seem to have had an insertion of this island of the rhodopsin and the biosynthetic genes to make the retinal cofactor just upstream. Um, so it looks like maybe horizontal gene transfer of this complete rhodopsin-making island into our sulfate reducer. So, um, where was I going with it? Yeah, so we've made trees of some of these, and if we look at, you know, this region, this is very clearly uh, part of a delta proteobacteria. On the other side, also delta proteobacterial genes, but these in the middle uh, don't, don't seem to come from any delta proteobacteria we know. And this is the first instance where we've seen a rhodopsin showing up in delta proteobacteria, and uh, that was kind of exciting. So if you look at where, uh, this is a tree made from uh, Susumu Yoshizawa's alignment that he sent me. Um, our rhodopsin from the sulfate reducer uh, shows up here in this interesting novel clade of rhodopsins called the NDQ motif rhodopsins. Uh, some of Susumu and some other people's recent work has shown uh, that these uh, rhodopsin proteins found in the uh, Bacteroidetes and Flava bacteria tend to, uh, this one has been functionally shown to be a uh, sodium pumping rhodopsin. Um, so that's really exciting. So it looks like it's got a Bacteroidetes style uh, sodium pumping rhodopsin and some recent work that uh, Susumu has done on our 
sulfate reducer rhodopsin has shown that ours also does pump sodium. So this is some recent experiments where he's been able to show that it does in fact uh, function similarly to the, the well characterized ones that are up here uh, in the tree. So just kind of really interesting that one of the first things that we found in these long read metagenomes was an interesting rhodopsin because if you look back sort of in the history of metagenomics one of the first big breakthroughs was finding these bacterial rhodopsins or proteorhodopsins uh, in, in the ocean and this was using uh, BACs, so long sequences, right? Because one of the things that's really hard to do with these is to be able to place them in the context because they're frequently horizontally transferred. So maybe, you know, with these long reads, it's kind of a, a back to the future. Please excuse my pun. Um, so uh, from the, the standpoint of sort of berry biology and also just thinking generally about, you know, sort of organisms and their interesting niches, it seems like we need to sort of revise our model and think about the fact that this is a consortia where this sulfate reducer that maybe normally lives uh, in the mud or we think about sulfate reducers living in the aphotic zone, this guy has been adapted uh, over many years to live in, in the sun. And so it does seem to have some adaptations that are suggestive that it might be using light uh, for some purpose. Now what exactly it's doing when it's using light to pump sodium ions, that's definitely still a mystery uh, that remains to, to be uncovered. Maybe energy, you know, maybe, maybe some other sort of sensing, who knows. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up um, and thank all of my wonderful collaborators from all over the place, UC Davis, PacBio, Caltech, uh, my geochemistry collaborators, um, certainly Susumu for his help with the rhodopsins, and then uh, we are this all started at the microbial diversity course uh, in Woods Hole, and then of course uh, our different and uh, various funding, uh, funding sources. And of course you for coming, thank you. All right, thank you Lizzie, that's really exciting stuff. Um, if you unmute your camera, we can uh, ask you, or uh, undo your screen share, I guess, we can uh, ask you questions directly. Um, okay. There was a question from uh, John Battlemente that came in a few minutes ago, just asking technically what were the, what were the, the, the tools you generated, or the tools used to generate the, the plot of those contig, uh, he says, contig node plot with bubbles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is a plot that was done with um, some code from Jason Chin at PacBio, um, and essentially what he's done, I, I will post it on Twitter, the details, but it that plot was visualized in Gephi, um, and it is a visualization of the best edges graph from the Solera assembler. Um, so that's the short answer. The long answer is Jason Chin wrote some code to do that, uh, and I'll post the link on Twitter after this so that you can, can find it. And feel free to ask me also. I can send you the code to make those same graphs. They're really fun. Uh, and then the, that, that graph then is untangled by letting it do some of its automated like detangling stuff. Uh, you can also visualize it in Cytoscape, but it doesn't detangle the graph as nicely. Awesome. Uh, there's a question from Jeff on Jeff Gralnick on culturing, but I've got one on that too. So I'm going to skip that. We'll come back to culturing in a second. Uh, okay. Jim Weaver has a, a question, uh, another technical question. What is the input concentration of DNA needed for PAC bio sequencing? Yeah, so that's, that's uh, depends who you ask, and it depends how good folks are at library prep. So the sample that was most of our data was generated from was a little bit under a microgram. Um, and part of that is that Cheryl Hainer is really awesome uh, at her job. So a lot of people have more trouble with that much. Uh, typically, sequencing centers, when you send them stuff, want five micrograms. Uh, Cheryl's able to work with about a little bit less than a microgram for that sample that, that I showed the data from today. But there's definitely, stay tuned and, and look, there there are lower input pack bio preps that are they're working on that are available, either combining them uh, with some sort of amplification or just low input preps that they're working on. So that's that's in the works. Awesome. But yeah, definitely, definitely a big limiting fact for using this for other stuff and something we're coming up against. Looking at doing this on some seep samples and other stuff is just getting enough material. It's hard. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, not for the faint, uh, not for the nanogram folks. Uh, nanograms for microliter folks. Not, uh, yet. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Kralnick's got two questions. The first is, are you on a boat or a waterbed or both? <laughs> I'm sitting on my bed at home. <laughs> yeah, a little shaky. Uh, he he's obviously in the land of high high internet speeds, but that's all right. But uh, a serious question from Jeff is: uh, 
he makes the point there's lots of cultivable, cultivatable gammas in the berries. Did you grow and sequence any heterotrophs? Interesting. Uh, not on purpose. Uh, <laughs> so I have an enrichment culture of um, the purple sulfur bacteria now. Um, and it has some sort of contaminant. So I guess answering Jeff's question, yes, but I'm trying to kill it. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, we haven't done any. Uh, we, we did some enrichments trying to look uh, for different Cytophaga and Bacteroidetes, but, um, but we haven't actually done anything specifically looking for gamma heterotrophs. And then I had a question regarding the, the just the, the microcosms that you showed where you had those little bottles that looked like you had I don't know. It did look like something you'd pick up at like the Froyo store or something. Um, they were beautiful, but I was wondering, how did you? What kind of procedures did you use to isolate the the berries away from their normal environment? Did you did you clean off? Did you clean them, or did you try to, you know, deal with what might be in between the berries, or were there any kind of procedures there that you did? Yeah, it was fairly crude. So we. Um, a soup strainer is how we separate them. So, like, you know, just going out there with a little sieve and collecting them. And then uh, it was a series of washes that we did in 0.2 micron filtered marsh water. So we'd collect water from the overlying pond, filter it, and then basically just take the berries out of the strainer, swish them in that filtered water maybe three or four times. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we got most of the... The goal was to get the sediment out and any, you know, sort of exogenous sulfide from the mud out, uh, but there's definitely a whole host of stuff on the outside, and that's something you see. You know, we see plenty of uh, different ocean-going bugs that were probably just stuck on the outside um, and that sort of stuff. But yeah. Sure. sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Are there any other questions for Lizzie? If there's anybody inside the Hangout that wants to ask a question, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and and pop up and say hi. Okay. Um, I have a question, Lizzie. Yeah, shoot. So what you mentioned, right, with the um, Illumina data, short reads, you get a clonal sort of likely insignificant organism. And then that was switching when I you had to the long... <laughs> um, I said they make nicer contacts. <laughs> but then when you switched to the long read technology, right, and then so you mentioned that you were now seeing, like you showed that super long contact, right, and was that something that was based on biomass or was that based on sort of ease of extraction or did you see any connection between like biomass and who comes out as a long read? Um, so the abundance, the read abundance looks the same between the different technologies. Okay. So if you're looking just at raw reads the, uh, and you look, if you're using the Illumina MySeq reads, they're long enough to get a reasonable blast hit, right? And so the classification of the reads looks the same. It doesn't look like there's a big skew. In terms of the assemblies, right now using PacBio alone, only our two dominant organisms are assembling particularly well. Um, we have assemblies with molecular of a lot of other stuff that's in there, uh, some of the bacteroidetes, the other things, and then kind of our next step uh, in terms of using it, and I think more importantly showing how it's going to be useful for people whose systems isn't 60% to bugs, uh, is combining it with the Illumina short read assemblies and using it to scaffold. Uh, and that's something we're pursuing doing with the data. So, yeah. but probably not not for the first thing that we're going to. So the other yeah. question is, um, what was the limit? So, when you made your pack bio library, what was the average library size that you went for? Um, in terms of like, did you go for a 10 kb library, or, or or did you try to go bigger, or what was the average? Library? No, the pack bio library was. It, I mean, you people would be horrified if you were trying to use that for assembling an isolate genome. It would have been really disappointing, right? So, our average insert size. They didn't do size selection. I don't, or not a very rigorous size selection. So that our average read length was only maybe two to three kb for pack bio. Yeah. yeah, they were not super long. So we had some that were super long, but maybe you know three. Maybe I'm not remembering exactly, but it was about three kb was our N50 for the pack bio. Um, I have a plot somewhere that I could pull up, but it's oh, not. It's, in this. I was just wondering because I was thinking like to get that big of a contact, did you start with like a 10 KB library or something, right? No, no, that was one of the interesting things. It really wasn't it wasn't that long. That's cool. Yeah. I have a couple. Now, part of that was just the a technical limitation in terms of the amount of DNA, and they had a lot of trouble with 
the DNA sort of progressively de degrading over the course of the um, the library prep. So. Yeah, and I would say with ours, it's hilarious that it's now we're hitting the limit of the ability of someone to not shear DNA during an extraction is the new issue yeah. in terms of getting long reads. <laughs> Ironic. Okay, thanks. Watch yeah. those watch those bee beaters, folks. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a couple more questions from John. Uh, two questions. One is, are you using short reads for self-correction? And the other is, are you running Celera within HGAP? Uh, no. So the error correction that I showed is using seed read correction, correction with the pack bio. So it's taking the shortest pack bio reads and aligning them to the longest pack bio reads. Uh, and so those are self-correcting. Um, you certainly could use the Illumina data. We just we haven't done that. And then the data was assembled, yeah, with the implementation of Celera uh, within HGAP three. I think uh, is is how we ran it. Uh, the molecular data assembly that I showed was assembled with regular Celera seven point um, and that was work that was done in collaboration with Sergey Korn because I had trouble installing it and figuring out what the right parameters were. So Sergey helped me kind of get that going, uh, running Solera on the long reads. Nice. Um, are there anything anything else that anybody's coming up with? Um, while we're waiting for maybe a couple last minute questions, Lizzie, can you tell folks how to get a hold of you if they uh, if they want to contact you about this? Where where can you be reached? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can reach me at Wilbanks, my last name, at Caltech.edu. Um, and yeah, that's the best way to reach me. Or Twitter uh, at Lizzie Wilbanks. Um, both things that I check reasonably. So yeah, send me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with anybody. Obviously, I'm, I'm one of the things I'm really excited about with the PacBio and molecular data set is as soon as we get this manuscript finalized here, which I am frantically peddling trying to do, uh, is releasing the data and having all of you start working on new tools because. You know, we've been able to take a nice crack at some of the top things on uh, on doing this, but I think it'll be really cool to see what the community comes up with in terms of new tools for dealing with long read and metagenomics. Cool. Nice. Well, thanks very much for a wonderful seminar. I think uh, this has given a lot of people food for thought, and it's exciting to see the new wave of, of metagenomics. Back to the future, favorite comment. Um, I think Jim pointed that out. Way to go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's been really fun. Thanks for having me. It's been nice to EC all of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to sign off for now. We'll see you in, a, in about a month, everybody. Bye.